Hello and welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm gonna be covering everything that you need to know about synthetic data. So if you don't know what it is or when to use it or really how to get it, then this is the video for you. I'm gonna walk through not only what synthetic data is, I'm also gonna talk about the methodological scenarios in which you should consider using it, and in some scenarios in which it's the best solution for your particular problem. I'm also gonna talk about the ways in which we can generate it with both closed source large language models, like GPT-4, and open source large language models. We're specifically gonna work with the newer one called quin 27 b now in this video, we're also gonna talk about how to generate synthetic data, both with user interfaces like ChatGPT and also in a Jupyter Notebook so that we can learn both how to automate the process and do some experiments with large language models for the creation of synthetic data. My goal by the end of this video is for you to have a good understanding not only about what it is, but why it's very useful and why everyone's talking about synthetic data so that you can start incorporating it in your own projects. So let's dive in. So what is synthetic data? Synthetic data is exactly what it sounds like. It's data that we generate, it's not real. Now in this video, we're gonna be talking about synthetic data in the context of named entity recognition, better known as NER. Now if you don't know what NER is, that's okay. It's not gonna be necessary for this video, but if you wanna learn about it, I have probably about 50 videos on this channel where we do NER in various languages, mainly in English and medieval Latin. But like I said, you don't need that for this video. So named entity recognition is a type of information extraction where we try to find named entities in a text and pull them out. Now, oftentimes we do this with both a rules-based approach where we come up with things like maybe lists or we use linguistic features to find and identify and extract named entities from a text, or we can use machine learning where we train a machine learning model to do this. In the last five or so years, we've got a couple different options available to us though. We have things like zero-shot classification where we can use a Gliner-like model architecture and automatically find and retrieve custom labels from a text with no training. But we also have other options available to us known as single shot or few shot. And this is where we use a single example of named entities in the text to improve the ability for a model, specifically usually a large language model to find and extract information. And few shot is basically the multiplication of, the, of single shot. We use multiple examples. In this video, we're gonna talk about the role of synthetic data in all these processes. So what we do with large language models is we use them to generate that kind of training data or example data automatically for us. Oftentimes we'll use them to not only generate the texts, but also to generate the annotations for us. There's a couple tricks that we can do along the way to help out some of the hiccups that you'll probably have in this process. The big one is going to be token alignment. Now each individual text is made up of individual tokens. Let's pretend for just a moment that tokens are just words or punctuation marks. They're a little more complex than that, but let's just think of that as what a token is for right now. It's very challenging for a large language model that doesn't have access to coding to find the start character or end character or start token and end token of a specific entity in a text. It can, however, identify and extract the entity itself as raw text. So oftentimes when we work with synthetic data, what we're trying to get a large language model to do is to generate not only a synthetic text or a fake text, but also generate a list of named entities that fall into specific categories like person, place or location, or something maybe a little bit more domain specific. I oftentimes work with Holocaust data. So in my case, something like concentration camp. So in synthetic data, what we do is we generate not only that text, but the list of entities and their corresponding labels. Oftentimes what we'll do is in a downstream task, we'll use an NLP framework like Spacey to automatically align each of those entities that have been extracted for us from that text in the synthetic data example and align them automatically with their start character and end character or start token and end token. And if you're able to do both of those steps, then what you're able to do is generate synthetic training data. Now, why is the synthetic training data so important? Well, the synthetic training data can be generated very quickly and very efficiently and can be used to train a custom smaller machine learning model to do a very narrow task, in our case, named entity recognition. So what this prevents us from having to do is spend months annotating data, which can be both laborious, so time intensive, and also expensive if you're paying people to do annotations. 
Also, humans, like ling large language models, are inconsistent in the way they annotate data. So this prevents the issue of having to hire out a team of maybe 10 or 20 annotators and maybe have inconsistent annotations across them. The synthetic data, because it can be generated so quickly, can often try and train a smaller machine learning model that can be run much more effectively, much more efficiently, and most importantly, locally, which means that you can use that smaller model that's been fine-tuned with synthetic data without any kind of security issues. So if you're using a large language model like maybe GPT-4, you don't have to worry about your data leaving your server and going to their server via an API. This makes large language models usage in the synthetic data generation process very appealing because it allows you to use fake data that doesn't have any security issues to then train a model to run over your secure data. And this gets to a really good point. When should you consider using synthetic data? There's a couple scenarios in which it's very useful. The first one is when you don't have enough examples for a label that you expect to find in the real world. Imagine we had a large collection of texts and we wanted to identify labels like people, location, date, and let's just say business. But unfortunately, we know that when we run our model over real world data, we're gonna find a lot of variant types of businesses. Unfortunately, we don't know the names of those businesses. What we do have though, is a lot of training data that has maybe a lot of biases towards things like date, location, and person. But we don't have enough examples, maybe we only have 10% of the same of everything else for businesses. So what do you do? Well, one of the things that you can do is you can use a large language model to generate synthetic data that has an increased number of businesses referenced within the text. This means that you have access to larger quantities of that label without having to go out and find them. This can save you a lot of time. Another scenario in which this is useful has been done in a project that I've been on recently. And this is where the data that you're working with is very sensitive in nature. In our case, we're working with very sensitive personal information from South Africa, a collection of letters specifically that details personal information. Now we don't want to use a large, that data to train a large language model for various ethical reasons, but we still need to find, extract, identify, and then mask the entities found within that text if that data is going to be used so that it can be used in some kind of analytical way. So what do we do? Well, one of the things that we can do is we can use a large language model to generate synthetic data that represents the real world data and then use that synthetic data to function as our training data, thus negating some of the ethical issues that might appear if we were using real letters that were sensitive in nature to train a machine learning model. So synthetic data has a couple real world applications that in some cases are a good solution and in other cases are really the only solution available to you if you consider ethics part of your workflow, as you probably should. So these are the two different scenarios in which I see synthetic data being very useful. It's also very useful if you just want to get a smaller model up and running as quickly as possible. This is particularly appealing with the advent of Gliner, which is a zero-shot named entity recognition uh, architecture. Gliner has been extremely popular over the last few months since it's been on, advertised on Twitter and LinkedIn, etc., and for good reason. Gliner is a lightweight model that is zero shot, which means that you can pass in not only a text to the model, but also you can pass in a couple set of, a custom set of labels that you want to find and extract from that text. Now here's what makes synthetic data really appealing. Gliner can be fine-tuned to your specific domain with very little data, meaning you can take the base model that's been trained to recognize a lot of different entities and might work okay with your data or might align things a little differently than the way you would like to see. You can maybe generate 100 to 1,000 examples fine-tune that model to your specific domain and have better results. Results that not only are going to align more with the entities that you'd like to find and extract, but extracted in the way that you want them to be extracted. So a good example of this is on a recent project where I was using the off-the-shelf liner model, and it was identifying in medieval Latin the word Ercumbertus Archbishop, essentially. Uh, so the Archbishop Ercumbertus. 
I want it to identify both the name and the title as a single entity. Now the base Gliner model was extracting only the individual's name. What I did was I used synthetic data, came up with 100 examples where people were annotated slightly differently, and I was able to not only get Gliner to recognize my named entities a bit better, but I was able to get it to extract both the name and its corresponding title as a single entity. So this is another real world scenario in which synthetic data is useful. So with all of that said, let's take a moment and jump on over to the user interface of ChatGPT so we can learn a few tricks for how we can generate good quality synthetic data. And we're gonna see a couple things be useful here. One is going to be specificity, and two is going to be a couple examples, and three is going to be using some kind of schema. Because synthetic data, in order to be used, needs to be consistent in structure and of good quality, and it needs to be as varied as possible. So we'll take a couple looks at how to do that in the chat GPT user interface. Next, we're gonna take a look at a Jupyter Notebook where we can generate synthetic data with an open source large language model, specifically Quinn 27B, which I'll be doing everything today on my MacBook Pro. So if you have a MacBook Pro of about 30 um, gigabytes or so, you'll be able to do both of these tasks. Really, in my experience, to generate synthetic data, 7B models are kind of the bare minimum. If you're able to have access to a larger GPU, I would recommend doing this with one of the open source 70B models, maybe Llama 70B or Quinn 2 72B. But that all said, let's go ahead and jump in and see what synthetic data looks like. And remember, if you don't have access to a GPU, all these steps can be done via an API as well, either with OpenAI, which is gonna have some closed source models, or via the Hugging Face Endpoints API, which will be open source models. Either way, your data is going to have to leave your system and go to another system. If so, if that's not acceptable to you, then sticking with this video and sticking with working with a local model might be a better choice. So all that said, let's just dive in. Now that we're in a user interface like ChatGPT, let's go ahead and try to generate some synthetic data. We're gonna say generate a text that describes the diet of a bird. Output the text and annotations according to this schema. So what I'm doing here is I'm being very precise in what I want the large language model to do, and I'm giving it a schema so that it can follow exactly how I want the data generated. And when we do this, we're gonna get the output where it's gonna align the text and the text key, and then a list of different entities uh, according to their specific label. The labels are the keys here, and then the list corresponds to the raw text that's found within that actual text itself. Now, we can take this output, and then like I said earlier in this video, use something like Spacey to align things so you can find the start and end tokens or characters for each of these entities that we found here. Now, one of the things I want to remind you is that this is a large language model, and this is stochastic and it's randomized. So you might not always get the exact output here. This is gonna take a couple of bit of experiments. It's gonna be adjusting the prompt. It's gonna be opening up a new uh, GPT-4 and trying to get it to generate the data correctly, and it's fine tuning and figuring out a prompt that works for you. But what we have here is good synthetic data once I have a prompt in the chat that I really like, I can experiment a little bit further. I can say generate 10 examples and output them as a single list. And this way I can now copy and paste 10 examples instead of one individually into something like VS Code, where I can then try to maybe fine tune something like a Gliner model, or maybe train a small spacey model from the synthetic data. And if we look here, GPT is generating for us 10 examples. And when it's done, I can copy and paste these over into VS Code, but it's really impractical if I wanna generate maybe more than 100 examples to do this. This is very laborious, it's gonna take me a long time, it's much more practical in this scenario, even though it'll cost something, to generate the synthetic data either via an API, such as the OpenAI API or Cloud API, or using something that is local, so using a local large language model. So let's go ahead and stop here in this chat GPT interface and see how we might generate synthetic data with an open source large language model. Now that we're in VS Code, let's go ahead and start trying to generate some synthetic data. I have a notebook here inside my other project, which is called YouTube for right now. 
Now, because I'm working on a MacBook, I'm gonna be using MLX LM. This is gonna do a lot of the heavy lifting for me so that I can get all the benefits of my M3 chip uh, without having to do a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, if you're working on a PC or Linux, you're probably gonna to wanna to use something from the Transformers library. And I'll have a link in the description down below for how you can do all of that. So I'm gonna go ahead and import MLX LM. And I'm also gonna go ahead and load up this specific model. This is the Quinn 2 7B Instruct. This name corresponds to its name on Hugging Face. We execute this cell and we're going to be able to load up our model and tokenizer automatically. If you haven't downloaded this model already, it's gonna download first for you. In just a few moments, it'll be loaded into memory and we can start using it. There we are. So let's go ahead and start using this model. So what I have here is a bit of a simplified prompt because again, we're working with a 7B model. The 7B model isn't gonna generate as good of data as a 72B version. However, I can use the 7B locally, which I'm very happy about. So I've made the prompt a little simpler in the kind of data that I wanted to annotate. I just have plant food, animal food, uh, eating time and eating location. And I've added a little more specificity here, only output is JSON. Now again, it's gonna be important to have that because we wanna have all of our data be outputted as JSON. And so what I've done is I've executed this whole script, which is going to essentially take that prompt and start generating a response for us. And we'll have it in just a second. I've set verbose to true, and that's gonna let it just kind of print off in real time, but we also have access to this as a variable after it's done. And it's generating a very long text right now, and we're getting everything that we'd expect to see. Now there's a couple issues with what we're seeing. One of the things is, is that we're getting these dots here at the bottom and we're also uh, getting text listed twice. So I print off response. We'll see that the dots are not actually coming through and everything looks fine. We have our line break still here and everything. So one of the important things to do is to actually make sure that what we're seeing is valid JSON. To do that, we can load up the JSON library and we can try to pass all of this into JSON. So let's say JSON response, it's gonna be equal to json.loads. This is gonna load up a string and we can pass that string and notice that we don't have an error. That's because our data is valid JSON. But what we're seeing here is one real big problem text here has been erased because the output of the LLM was two different text entries. That's a mistake and we don't want that. But the good thing is because this is local, we can rerun this as many times as we want to and it's not going to cost us anything except for time. More importantly, because this is local, we can automate this whole process. There are a couple other checks that you can do here to ensure that the quality of your data is better, such as maybe doing something like schema validation, but that's gonna be beyond the scope of this video. Hopefully this though gives you a sense for how to generate synthetic data with a large language model and something like ChatGPT, but also more importantly, how to do it inside of a notebook. I'm gonna be posting other videos on synthetic data where we start to use this for real projects and we go through the whole process from beginning to end so that we learn not only how to generate the synthetic data, but also, and this is most important, how to actually use it to train a model to do something like named entity recognition. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this video, like and subscribe down below. And as always, I put out all this content for free, so if you get a lot out of this channel, consider supporting it either by buying me a coffee or on YouTube memberships or on Patreon, all of which are linked down below. Thank you.